Lecture number 11. There are several places in the Doctrine and Covenants where it describes the way the gospel should be taught. And I always think of LeGrand Richards when I read those passages because it always says that you're to speak forth the gospel, the good news, as the sound of a trumpet, and you are to lift up the souls of men and bear witness to the great thing that has happened among the children of men in the earth. And he's one of the most proficient in it. He never has to read from a manuscript. I've never seen him read a manuscript, even when it was required by the um, Federal Communications Commission. And... Um, they used to have that requirement on radio. You had to submit a manuscript in advance. And when President Grant asked him to submit a manuscript, why he said, why, you know what I'm going to say, President Grant. President Grant said, yes, I believe I do. That's good enough. And he said, I'm going to bear witness. And he's just wonderful, a tremendous spirit. Uh, we had them at our home for dinner a few years ago when we first moved up to Salt Lake. He and his good wife were happy enough to grace our table and... My, there was a deep, wonderful spirit came with him. And uh, I don't know how many of you have ever read the book um, uh, about Peter, um, uh, the minister in Washington that was so famous, uh, a man called Peter. What was his last name? Marshall. Marshall, Peter Marshall, right. He was the um, chaplain of the Senate when I was back in Washington. And his exposure to Mormonism was through Le Grand Richards, and he gave fine LDS sermons continually. Um, kind of interesting to, uh, to try and understand those great minds, why they don't uh, quite find it possible to come across the, uh, the barrier uh, in order to partake of everything. But they just naturally know that something very good and great is happening here. Now, there's another very outstanding speaker on radio and television all the time in Los Angeles that's constantly using some of our literature and makes no um, bones about it. When I was serving as mission, stake mission president in Washington, the Presbyterian Church, which was very sophisticated and so forth, uh, asked me to give a talk on um, the origin of the Book of Mormon, and I thought that was kind of strange. And, and so I did. I came and I told how we got it and uh, what it represented. And afterwards, the minister pulled a copy out from underneath the rostrum and he said, Now you good people know why I keep quoting out of that book. <laughs> Real interesting. <laughs> so good is spread one way or another, and our task is to make sure that we properly represent what's in the book in our personal lives. But it's always great to hear Brother LeGrand Richards. Now, it isn't very often that you can prepare your lesson for this class and have it in the morning paper. But that's what you're doing right now. Today's lesson and Thursday's lesson are in today's headlines. And this was seen by Isaiah about 750 to 700 BC. It was seen again by Nephi. It was seen by Father Lehi. It was seen by Father Adam, by Enoch, and a number of others we could mention. Uh, so what you're reading now actually is, um, th this isn't uh, even exciting anymore, it's happening. I mean, this is unfolding. It's very exciting, though, to the Israelis to know that, um, uh, according to the Book of Mormon, after their sweat, blood, and tears, who's going to win this war? Yes, they, they'll be blessed in winning it. They are really taking a pummeling at the moment, but they're going to win it. And the, the, you started out today with chapter 13, which said they were really going to get it in the latter days. And they've been getting it. And uh, they'll get it some more. Now, some of our people say, do you think this is Armageddon? And when they ask that question, they show their lack of understanding of the whole prophetic picture. Because before Armageddon, what must happen in Jerusalem? There must be a temple built. And Armageddon fights the war right up to the borders and precincts of the temple. And two members of the priesthood will be there to use and exercise the same priesthood that Enoch did to hold back the forces of Gog and Magog for three and a half years. And Joel describes how terrible they would be, and they'll have the firepower, he says, to just cleanse the earth if it weren't for the curtain of fire that is raised up by God 
through these two prophets to stand between them and Jerusalem. It'll be very much like it was in the days of the Pharaoh. He came storming out of Memphis expecting to hem the people into the Red Sea and all of a sudden the, the, the pillar of fire moved from in front of the children of Israel who were crowding down toward the seashore around in back of them and then through the flames of fire the Pharaoh and all the other Egyptians could see the sea open up and uh, their slaves disappear into the depths thereof. And at, after uh, most of the night had passed, the pillar of fire then went it through itself. It went right down along the bottom of the sea. And the Pharaoh said, well, what's good enough for them is good enough for us. So in he went. That was the trap. Anyway, he got inside and uh, got right in the center and all of a sudden got scared and tried to turn around and get back. And it was all over in about 60 seconds. Well, this curtain of fire will stand between the city of Jerusalem and Gog, which means prince of the Gentiles, and Magog, which means the tribes of the Gentiles, in this distant, uh, not too distant period when, the, when Magog, uh, or Armageddon I should say, will occur. But it's not yet. It's not yet. So let me just share very briefly with you what's happening in the Middle East, and then you can apply it to the scriptures you've been studying, and that you'll study on Thursday. You're right in the middle of a prophetic declaration concerning our times. Uh, there's a lot of other things too, but it's interesting that th that should be there. Okay, now if you can all see, here's Cairo, the ancient city of Nephi, or Memphis. Here's the Suez Canal right down here, Suez Canal. This is the Sinai Peninsula, and here is the border of Israel right here. And it used to be down here, but now it's over here. In 1967, they took everything over to here. There used to be a big chunk out here, but they took all of that down to the River Jordan. Clear up here to the Sea of Galilee. Now, it's 3,000 feet above sea level. 3,000 feet above sea level on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. Big high cliffs, they're called the Golan Heights. And when we were there in 62, the Syrian cannons would blow up any ship that went out on the Sea of Galilee to fish. So sometimes we weren't able to go on the Sea of Galilee because they were shooting. Or they'd shoot right down into helpless Jewish villages below them. Each time it was a violation of the UN ceasefire. And the UN observers would make a careful notation that a ship was sunk by the Syrian cannons. <laughs> David Ben-Gurion, the Prime Minister, said to the UN, I'll give you one week to clean out those nests or to prevent those people from firing on us or I'm going to go over and clean up them myself. We said that we would be subject to UN discipline and action. And we're now giving you your chance. And you either use it or we're going in. So right while we were there, UN did nothing. So he went in and took, cleared out all that area. And immediately the General Assembly met and censored Israel. I said to the UN observers, why don't you censor the, the Syrians for violating and breaching the peace? Well, it's, um, it's just guerrilla action. I said, what do you mean guerrilla action? With cannons? That's not guerrilla action. That's the Syrian government. Well, it's, it's, it's really a very delicate situation. I said, yeah, especially for the Jews down there. In any event, in the War of 67, one of the first things that they did was to get up there and take those Golan Heights, and they were fortified like the Rock of Gibraltar, and I really didn't think they'd be able to take them, but they did uh, in about 12 hours. So they've been holding the Golan Heights, and I thought they might go on to Damascus, but Moshe Dayan, you know, the one-eyed general, he said, no, we don't want anybody's capital, we don't even want any land. We just want peace. And we're going to hold the Golan Heights so that we can have peace. That's all we want. Meanwhile, they got clear to the Suez Canal, and um, the prime minister at that time said, well, we don't want all this either. Just desert. They've since struck oil. That's helped. But meanwhile, they, they, we didn't want that desert especially, but you keep coming across there with your tanks and, and attacking us. Oh, so we'll hold it at the Suez Canal. So they've held it now, you see, since 67. Now, the Egyptians attacked. Israel knew that they were going to attack, but did not attack them the way they did in 67. See, in 67, they found out they were attacking the next morning at 9 o'clock. So the Jews attacked at uh, 2.15 a.m., and that war was over in about two and a half hours. The rest was kind of mopping up. They got 80% of all the Arab aircraft on the ground. So 
The rest was just a question of capturing about $2 billion worth of cannons and tanks and half-tracks out here. And that was the end of the war. All right, now look what, what Moshe Dayan, who's the defense minister, is doing. Instead of coming down here where the Egyptians are attacking them, he's giving up down there. Do you notice that? And he has focused all his forces, his major blunt, uh, the brunt of his attack is right up there. And uh, they're within about nine miles of Damascus. And I don't know what, where they were by noon today, but they're awfully close now. They're in the suburbs of the city. Just a question of time till they take it. And when they take Damascus, they will have everything to the Euphrates River. And that's all the Bible promises them. It doesn't promise them anymore. They'll have it. And uh, then, by that time, and I'm just guessing now, but I won't be surprised if this is what's happening. These troops down here are making no attempt to prevent that beautiful new Russian equipment from coming across the Suez. Or they occasionally bomb one bridge just to make it look like something, but I, don't know, I notice they leave the other three or four open. And that traffic is going across just as fast as it can go, and those tanks uh, are from uh, here to, to that window over there. They are great, big, beautiful monsters that uh, they are superior to anything that anybody is building. Wonderful equipment to get. And I notice <laughs> there's the Suez Canal there. Back 15 miles are the three passes. You go up about 3,000 feet to get up on the desert. And there's the Mitla Pass and two other passes that move down to the Suez Canal. They're right up to the passes right this moment. Now it's going to be very interesting to see what the Israelis do. If they move back from those passes, which they could very easily hold, you can be sure that the strategy is to suck all that equipment up onto the desert. Just as much as they can get. And the Arab leaders, you see, they've tasted a little success. And I've watched them. They're extremely emotional. The Arab people are a, a very uh, warm, easy-to-meet people, but unfortunately are also easily victimized by their leaders when they have, don't have freedom of the press. So they're tasting a little success now, and it looks like they're going right through those passes. They're right to them now. And the Israelis could hold them. They, those passes are possible to absolutely stop them with. And, and if they let them come up onto that main section of the desert, then it, it will be obvious that Moshe Dayan's policy is to make a gesture of resistance and get as much across the Suez as they can, and then go around them, you see, and close off the Suez. And then you have the very latest models. <laughs> the ones I saw there in May, you see, were 67 models. It's time to get the new ones. <laughs> anyway, that's what's happening. The thrust is toward Damascus. This front is retreating. And I watch, I listen to uh, commentators, and they'll say it looks very bad for the Israelis. Uh, they are definitely being driven back. They are not being able to hold their line. And, uh, but of course, up in Damascus, they're moving forward. And I said, naturally, yeah. They could hold the line there. They're, they're outnumbered about two and a half, almost three to one. But they have superior training, superior tactical strength. Uh, here's the force to watch out for, this one right across here in uh, Jordan. They've been trained by the British, and they are crack troops. And the Arab is a very good fighter under good leadership. Terrific. But last time Egypt lost 38,000 men out on that desert and didn't raise one finger to rescue any of them. The only ones that were rescued were rescued by Israel. The Red Cross tried to get Egypt to help and Egypt wouldn't. So thousands and thousands were saved by Israel. But uh, 36,000 were killed by the heat. 120 degree heat out there. So you only have to be out there a day and a half, two days, and that's all. You're through. Any questions? Yes? Attacking Cairo. They have already bombed it a couple of times. Is it a night bombing, was it? <coughs> well, uh, this, they are very vulnerable here. Uh, in the last war, in the 67 war, if Israel had come on through here, you'd have had abs four million people streaming out into the Sahara. Uh, they're, they're just panic in the presence of Israeli troops. I don't know what, what it is, but even the Egyptians told me that they panic in the presence of Israeli troops. 
and uh, they'll fight right up to the time that they're winning. There's the slightest possibility they're losing, they all take off their shoes. You can run faster in the sun, they just, you can run in the sand, you can run faster without shoes. In fact, I saw pictures of dozens of truckloads of just shoes, Egyptian shoes. <laughs> yes? Now that's something, isn't it? One and a half times more planes have been shot down than Israel ever had. Uh, no wonder we're airdropping them in. It's kind of interesting now. What you're going to do is see, um, see Russia uh, wants to uh, fight this war down to the last Arab. Now, this is the way she fights. <coughs> and the United States is going to furnish material on the side of Israel. And uh, so these people are doing the dying and the suffering. And it's just a tragedy. You see, this has been the communist Russian policy in Korea. Fight, have Koreans fight Koreans down to the last, Korean, last person. Cuba. Cubans fight Cubans down to the last Cuban, see? It's an old policy. And here these people are cousins, Arabs and Jews, actually are relatives, and have been able to work very well together in times of peace. But Isaiah saw it, and he said the temple would be built, and it would be restored, the people would gather once again to the ancient homeland, and God would do a work with them, but they would really be punished and cleansed before they're through. Now they're very irreligious people now, I don't know whether you knew that or not, but uh, agnosticism and atheism characterize nearly the whole people. <coughs> the orthodox are even more difficult to deal with than the atheists and the agnostics. And um, they don't want anything to be done, they think God must do it all, so they don't even fight or anything. But over in, in Israel, they're the only people that don't have to fight are Arabs and those who are ill. Everybody else has to fight. There's no such thing as a conscientious objector in Israel. Other questions? No, the Jordanians have come in to help, but they're helping up on the Syrian front, so they are not attacking across the river, which is what you would expect. So that's a, uh, that helps Israel. She's able to concentrate on the two ends, and uh, the, she can pretty well handle each end. If she had to handle Jordan, <coughs> coming across in the 67 war, that was the panic of the war when Jordan came into it under Egyptian generals. Hussein's brother is uh, a very um, oh, emotional about this whole thing. Hussein himself thinks that war of any kind is bad. So the Jews have tried to work with him, but uh, so far uh, they've been able to pressure Hussein into um, at least participating on the surface. All right, any further questions? Mm -hmm. Well, they've taken on Russia and seven, Egyptians, seven Arab nations so far. In 67, they took on the United States and bombed the SS Liberty when it got involved in uh, um, jamming the, the radio communications down there. That was the CIA or the State Department. It wasn't the Navy. Anyway, the Liberty got, took it. Of course, Moshe Dayan said, I didn't know whether it was an American ship or not. The Egyptians used the American flag in, 50, in 56, and I, we, we, we didn't know. All we knew what it was, it was against us. We couldn't communicate out in the battlefield, so we shot it down the whole upper deck. Of course, we were sorry. <laughs> and we're willing to compensate. And the State Department says, forget it. We don't want any more talk about it at all. It was very embarrassing to the State Department, because that State Department, that whole section of it is loaded with pro-communist people. And if you're against the Soviet Union, why, well, you're an enemy. And they were using our ships and our facilities and our flag and our good name to carry out subversive activities. The Navy didn't know anything about it. Even, uh, uh, it had told the Israelis where every one of their ships was. Told the Egyptians, too. Nobody had been told about the SS Liberty. Seventy-six Americans were killed. And Moshe Dayan said, I don't know what you're doing out there. But they said, forget it. No problem. And no, it doesn't. It comes um, in fantastic victory. I've actually drawn the map of where the Lord says it goes. And it, isn't, uh, it doesn't include all of Sinai even. Uh, and, but it does include Damascus. And it does include Jordan. Now, I'll, I think I mentioned this the other day. I won't be a bit surprised if during one of these wars the great Dome of the Rock is bombed. 
Uh, the Jewish people said, we will keep their buildings sacred, but of course in a war if they shoot up their own buildings, well, that's their business. And if, if the Dome of the Rock were bombed, the Jews would immediately commence their temple, I think. So, I won't be surprised if that happens during one of these skirmishes, this one or the next one. I said that in 67, and I still think that that's the way it'll be destroyed, by their own people. Yes, we do, we do regularly. Um, in the war of 48, uh, Israel fought all along. The United Nations abandoned her, Britain abandoned her, the United States abandoned her. In 56, we not only abandoned her, but went back after she had taken Sinai and put pressure on her to make her give up Sinai, which she did with the promise that we would keep, up the, uh, keep open the Aqaba Gulf where she gets 90% of all her oil. Uh, we guaranteed we keep that international water. In 1967, um, Egypt closed the Aqaba Gulf in violation of the uh, previous agreement in 56. And so the United States said to the other maritime powers, you signed the pact with us, you 59, we 59 people all signed the pact to keep those waters open. Let's each send in a battleship and we'll deliver oil. That's, those are international waters. Uh, 58 immediately backed out and the Secretary of State said, uh oh, sorry we brought it up. We abandoned them, and little Israel stood absolutely alone on June the 5th, 1967, with the U.S. Uh, News and World Report saying they don't have a ghost of a chance. Look at the odds. And so uh, one week later they said, um, the ghost arose. <laughs> and uh, so that's why I wrote Fantastic Victory. See, everybody says, well, sure, they made it real tough, boy. Those Sabra, they really fight. Uh, boy, it was, it was illogical. It was militarily impossible for Israel to have done what she did, you would have thought. But she won that war in about two and a half hours. And the rest was mopping up. Well, it's kind of interesting to listen to the prophets because when Paul Harvey was on our campus, he said, well, of course, the Jews will be driven out again, like the scripture says. And I said, uh, where did you get that from? Oh, Billy Graham told me that. I said, well, here's a Book of Mormon. Uh, and they are not going to be driven out again. The gathering has now commenced and will go forward right up to the end and they'll build their temple and tremendous things will happen. But they're going to be purged. There are many wicked people among them. There are many good people among them. And they're going to go through a real seesaw grind now to purge them. So when I go over there I and I talk to them. We can talk on anything except religion because they don't understand religion at all. To them that's hocus pocus, you know. It's, they just don't believe in religion. That's such a shock to our people who go over there on tour. Do they want to sit right down with them and start studying the Old Testament and the prophets? No. They study it as archaeology and history, not as a scripture. They expect their Messiah to be a politician, not any divine person. That's why they're going to be so shocked when he shows up. Because they are going to have a politician who is going to rise up and be kind of a messiah for them and guess what his name is going to be? David. David. And he'll be called the branch. Five of the Old Testament prophets talk all about him. And what is his mission? To build a temple and prepare the Jews for the second coming. And apparently he will, be not, he will not be successful because when Christ does come he'll apparently withhold his glory and as they all surround him uh, after this marvelous rescue uh, they're going to say, according to Zechariah, what are the wounds in thy hands and thy feet? Well, he said, these are wounds I received in the house of my friends. You mean you are the one? Superstar? <laughs> you are for real? See, that's why the Jesus Christ Superstar was written. The author said, we wanted to show you what a fake we Jews think he was. They're two British authors. And it's the Jewish interpretation of the Messiah when he came the first time. And when I say Jewish, I mean in their tradition. It's the traditional Jewish attitude toward the Christ. And a lot of Christians go to see it thinking this is going to be a great inspirational show. Well, uh, they, they are presented with a, a Mary Magdalene who's a woman of the street and uh, a um, Judas who is a hero and a Christ who is a fake. That's Jesus Christ, superstar. 
when Mary sings, I don't know how to love him, he's just like other men, and I love him like I do other men, and yet uh, they say he's different, and so forth. And Judas says to Christ, why do you talk about this God business? We didn't start out that way. You're going to get us all in trouble. The Romans are going to take us if you don't, uh, don't lay off this business of being a, a God or something. And See how they rationalize it? Right down the drain. That's the theme. I got, a, I got a copy of the script, as a matter of fact, so I could study it and just see what they had done. It was real interesting how, how they'd done everything they could to destroy the integrity of the messianic mission of the Savior. Well, now, will you turn to page, uh, or to um, 2 Nephi 9, verse 41, in your Book of Mormon, and will you write in the margin, the temple, just put in the temple. This is the only verse in the entire Book of Mormon that refers to the endowment. It's 9 and 41. Any in this class who have had their endowments? Any in this class? Yes, we had several. All right, now you'll catch the significance of this passage. The entire temple service is to have you go through a training experience preparatory to be, be being presented to the Savior at the time of your... Uh, resurrection and introduction into the celestial kingdom. And what Jacob is saying in that verse is that when you go through the veil, you will not be met by someone representing the Lord. It will be the Lord in person. And if you know that, going through the temple becomes that much more thrilling. It's a teaching experience, a covenant-making experience, but it's designed to prepare you for that sacred moment when you will make personal contact with the Savior. So I don't want you to forget that. Second Nephi 9 and 41, that's the only verse. Now it talks about secret combinations in the latter days in this chapter. Uh, it talks about how the Jews will be helped by the Gentiles, but both Gentiles and Jews who try to prevent God from doing his work will be destroyed. Um, and we have both, of course, in the conspiracy and uh, I use that word advisedly, just like Moroni does in chapter Ether. We have some people who immediately get uptight if you use the word conspiracy. They say there is no such thing. Then I say, you are denying the prophets. We were told there would be a conspiracy. Our task is to find it out. And if the one that I've identified and others have identified is not the one, then you tell us where the conspiracy is. They say, well, we think that that's just an illusion of the extreme right. I said, then it was an illusion of the prophet Moroni in the book of Ether, chapter 8. And it's all through the Book of Mormon, the great secret combinations of the latter days. And it's kind of exciting once you know who they are and how they're working to watch them work. They're amazingly uh, ingenious, the way they manipulate things, or manipulate things around. I just uh, picked up a few copies of the, um, of the new Freeman Report. Uh, this one is on the United Nations and has both pro and con, pro and con, why people are for it and what the criticism is. And we always present it. We don't tell you uh, which side to accept or believe, just tell you the story. Here's the story. There's the whole charter. And if you put one of those in your file drawer, that's probably the best little summary of the pro and con on the United Nations that you can get in eight pages. They, the editors really did a good job. There's a list of all the members, the 132 members, and here's... Uh, uh, see, it was set up to preserve peace in the earth. And here's one of the uh, congressmen uh, saying, and where was the UN? And then he lists all the things which uh, went wrong. Uh, and, um, but there's the whole charter of the United Nations. And there are just a few, but any of you want me, well, it's in the Freeman Report that comes out every two weeks and takes a major issue and tells you the pro and con uh, of both sides. This is something that resulted from my students coming to me and saying, Brother Skousen, uh, have you got anything on um, the firing of um, General MacArthur? Yes. Where is it in Salt Lake? Um, would you mind bringing it down? No. So I'd bring it down. Pretty soon my car is like a truck going back and forth. So anyway, I finally decided to just rent a little place down here, and I took all my files and all my books and just set them up where the students could read them. And then we started taking current issues and presenting both sides 
without editorializing or trying to tell you how to conclude. We just wanted the best people on both sides to say their piece and have you be able to hear it. Uh, it's been uh, kind of exciting what's happened to that little paper. It comes out every two weeks. It's now being subscribed to by universities and libraries and congressmen. It's really moving out. And it was just an effort to uh, try to tell the story because you see our, our Latter-day Saints get so confused in their ignorance that they sometimes end up on the wrong side. They don't want to be on the wrong side. So I feel that they'd be on the right side most of the time if they just had both sides in front of them so they could choose. So anyway, that's why we have it. But that one on the UN is just excellent. The editors really did a good job for us. Now over in, um, uh, over on chapter 12 was a description of the building of the temple in the tops of the mountains. Now this is a multiple fulfilled, it's one of these multiple prophecies. It's fulfilled in the mountains of America and it's fulfilled in the mountains of Judea. But chapter 12 is specifically referring to what temple? We quote it very often for our temple, but it's talking about what temple? The one yet to be built in Jerusalem. Now, uh, uh, there are some other scriptures that talk just about our temples in the mountains, but these partic this particular chapter is talking about the temple yet to be built. But the same thing was fulfilled, actually, uh, repetitiously, when we build our temples out here. Now, um, um, there was one chapter here about uh, the women uh, of Zion. And uh, I just wanted to mention something very briefly about that because apparently we're going to go through kind of a threshing too. And it apparently is going to involve a lot of our, our young people. And there is going to be a manifestation of pride among some of them. So our purpose here at BYU is to develop a, a firm culture of modesty and no matter how the styles go, uh, they may go to... Uh, uh, topless and no matter you no know, telling what as street dress before they're through uh, no matter what they do we have a standard that as Latter-day Saints we'll hold to and it says the daughters of Zion that get to prancing around with tinkling feet and all of this uh, 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 Ziegfeld Follies gear hanging on them um, their, they will, their pride will be taken from them because they will be among those that will feel this terrible experience. It sound, you can't tell for sure. It sounds like atomic war and fallout, the loss of hair and all of this sort of thing. Joel sounds the same way. He said in front it's the Garden of Eden, behind it's desolation because fire has destroyed everything. Crops won't grow, the cattle all die. Sounds like a period of atomic warfare. In any event, those who are careful to listen to the Lord, those who are prepared, need not fear. They need not fear. But otherwise, the church will be purged and threshed. And so that's what that's talking about. And those that have been proud among the daughters of Zion are definitely going to be humbled. And if there is fallout, it, all the hair comes out, and instead of well-placed hair, it says there will be baldness and a scab, and that will be true of the wicked and those that are caught in that process. Let's see, there's one place over here I wanted you to be sure and kind of keep in mind for the next two and a half minute talk you give. Jacob tells us that it's the will of the Lord that we not waste our probation. Where was that, about 141 maybe? I just listed some of the ways that people are wasting their probation these days. Let's see, where did I put that? Oh, here it is, 163. And uh, good people are being trapped by this. I was visiting some friends recently. They'd been watching all day Friday, or all Friday night, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday on TV, sports mostly. Just sports. And, and I've watched myself. Boy, it grabs you. I'm walking through the room and the TV is on. I go through and, who, is he going to make it? Ooh. Oh, I didn't quite make it. Put it down. I've got to watch the next one. And that, if the play will get you. Now, um, two hours ought to be absolute maximum in front of the TV per day. And you've just got to discipline yourself or you will not know your scriptures. You'll not be doing what you're supposed to be doing. And you'll be whiling away, just like Lucifer wants you to do, this very precious time. And then you're going to come up and say, you know, I wish I could do this and I wish I could do that. And I wish I knew this and I wish I knew that. And you won't. And it will be important for you to know it. And it will be because you let yourself get trapped 
on some of these hooks that Satan has set up there. Then some of our fine young people get caught up in immorality and they get caught up in drugs. They get, up in, they get caught up in white collar crime. They're real nice people. They just embezzle $750,000 from the church, that's all. We only had two or three instances in the whole history of the church when we had nice people steal uh, an embezzle. We got a couple of them in prison now. They were right in the church office building, stealing the tithes of the church. Very seldom happens. Or they'll steal from businesses. They're just dishonest criminals, that's all they are, but they seem to be living high and Anyway, that's, those are some of the ways that he captures us. Now, I wanted you to be sure and notice a couple of things. You see, on page 164, I quoted Bertrand Russell. And I wanted you to know what it would be like not to be at BYU, to go to school where I had to go to school. I heard everything that Bertrand Russell heard. I was told he was one of the greatest men and I should read all his books because he was the kind of person I should follow and emulate. Well, listen to Bertrand Russell. The first dogma I came to disbelieve was free will. Well, that's just great to sit and be told I don't have any free will. So I find myself doing some ding-dong things, you see, and I'll say, imagine that. Can't help it. Boy, that's my environment. Sure enjoying it. <laughs> you see? That's what they do. And that's the kind of lives they live. They don't resist evil. They enjoy it. And then he says, the next thing I stopped believing was it was immortality. And by the time I was 18, I stopped believing in God. In fact, very shortly thereafter, I had abandoned all of the dogmas of Christianity. And then I was much happier. What do you think of that? You know what kind of happiness it was? It's the uh, satisfaction of human manifestation of personal will in violation of everything that previously has restricted them. And we have some of our students, late teenagers, away from mom and dad first time. Wow! Let her go. And they do. Then we pick them up a little later on. And then there are the tears and the bruises and the problems and all the repenting and all the remorse. So we try to keep as many as we can from getting hurt that way. And we, we're able to work through about, eight, about 85%. We have about 15% of our young people get hurt. But about 85% we're able to pull through without going through that trauma of finding out the bitter hard way like Alma the Younger. And then I, there was one more and we got just a minute. I think that was over on page 191 or 90 something. I wanted you to listen to uh, Brock Chisholm, the first president of the, um, of the National Health Association. 192, is it? I, I, see, you don't get those people at BYU, and you know why not? We don't allow anybody on this campus to come and take up your valuable time trying to tell you that two times two is seven. Because we believe in academic responsibility. What do you think of that? We believe that anything that is known to be absolutely destructive and false is not to be allowed to compete with your time. If you want to go out on your own and check on it, and so that's fine. But it's so, such valuable time here, we try to bring you the best, not the worst. And where we know somebody's going to try and teach you two times two is seven, we just don't give them an audience. That's called academic freedom under academic responsibility. And some other universities, they pride themselves in bringing in every psychopath and degenerate and uh, uh, hung up drug addict to harangue the students. And they always get a percentage of them. And Brother Tanner, we've got 30 seconds now, Brother Tanner quoted in this month's Ensign magazine, the student at the University of Utah who was just leaving his role as, I think, the editor of the Chronicle, saying, at the end of four years, I give you my farewell... Um, song and this is it and it's a heartbreak to read it it really is as he tells sh shows you how his whole value system has been reversed and you can just tell he's a very confused mixed up person and brother Tanner that could happen on this campus that it could happen on any campus it just happened to be there it's in the end sign you might want to read it all right that will be all for today